Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Woo! <laughs> That's what I call Resurrection Sunday. So if you're visiting with us this morning, a relatively new, um, we are a church who believes in a living God. Amen. And if he's alive, then our church liturgy, liturgy, which is what we do when we gather together, is not set by us. We have a plan, believe it or not. We have an idea what the Lord might be doing, and we, we plan accordingly and prepare accordingly, but Jesus can do whatever he wants to do. <laughs> This is his church, and when he's amongst us and he wants to do something, then our goal is to bow and to say, yes, Lord, whatever you want to do, you do that. And I do want to just reiterate what I said earlier, is that if the church, and if this church, if Crowded House Church is not being built by the power and presence of God the Holy Spirit, then what are we doing? What are we doing? I read a text earlier where Jesus told his disciples, wait for the gift of the Spirit. Wait for the outpouring of the Spirit. And then I read a text again where the apostles had already been filled with the Holy Spirit, but were filled with the Holy Spirit again. It's an ongoing need that we have to have lives empowered by the Spirit. And God so graciously showed this to me as I was prepping the sermon in in the last two weeks. So uh, we were in Cape Town the first week. We had some um, apostolic training, uh, which always is, it is, what is it, love? How would you describe it? Intense. Yeah. intense. <laughs> it is intense. Um, one word, intense. Um, intense in every way. Um, because we are part of a movement, and there are many, many, many movements that are faithful to God. It's, this is not the be-all and the end-all. Okay, 412 means nothing in some senses. It's only because of 412 is a part of the kingdom of God and about the kingdom of God and the king. Uh, it's like Crowder House Church, really. Who cares about Crowder House Church? But if Crowder House Church is about the kingdom and the king, then it, th- it, that matters. Does it make sense? And uh, we are part of a people and a leadership and a, a global movement of people who are utterly devoted to Jesus and who have a desire to see churches who look like Christ so that we can portray to the world. That's what God has called us to do, to 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 put him on display, not to put ourselves on display, to put him on display for all the world to see. Whether they hate him or love him is immaterial. That's not on us. But we must put Christ on display. That's what he called us to do. And that was really the takeaway from that week is everything we're doing in Christ's church as leaders and leaders within 412, whatever your role is and your function is, right? Are you actually putting Christ on display? Is that what we're building? Something that reflects the beauty and the wonder of Jesus and everything that he is. That's what we're about. And so the first week was intense. And the second week, we had a bit of a holiday, which was great. Cape Town is beautiful. And we are incredibly happy to be back. That's the honest truth. Um, Honestly, I love Johannesburg. Um, I love all of your funny faces sitting in front of me, and I'm sure you missed this funny face, and, and um, it's good to be back. But what the Lord showed me over this last two weeks, again, just a simple thing, that, listen, Kevin, um, this thing is not resting on you, so chill out. This is not about you. This is about me. And now what I do does matter because I've been called to be faithful But Jesus is building his church. Kevin is not building his church. And I just, uh, I've come into this morning so relaxed. And when I relax, I generally preach longer. So So push out your lunch date, your plans. Just WhatsApp quickly. Take a moment. I'm just joking. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Um, But really, Jesus is building his church. And he's doing that by the Spirit. And so... If, if we are doing the building, we can build something significant. We can. But in whose eyes? In whose eyes? And even as you build your own life, you have to think about this. This is not just in relation to you sitting here on a Sunday morning. This has got to do with you being a son and a daughter of the Most High God, part of the household of the Lord. How are you building your life? Are you building your life on your own steam? Are you building your life with your own strategy? Are you building your life for your own glory? 
We need to think about this. I, I can do the same. Ministry, in some sense, no difference to what you're doing. I can build ministry, my own ministry, for my own glory, my own ambitions, my own everything else. Apostles are doing all the time. That's what they do. All right? I can, we can get coffee cups made with my face on it and, you know... <laughs> I think, Sasha, let's put that in, you know, just in the agenda for discussion. <laughs> People will stop drinking coffee. That's what, we try, that's what we're trying to do. Anyway, the Spirit is building. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to Colossians. Let me stop waffling. Colossians chapter 2. So it's Resurrection Sunday, as you know. And um, we had a beautiful time this morning. I just want to say thank you for everyone that was involved in that in organizing that, running around and making sure that happened. Thank you very much. I thought it was a beautiful time. Amen? Amen. And so, um, yeah, I love that I could be a part of it. Last year I was sitting in the States and seriously had some FOMO. Uh, and I think people were just rubbing it in. They were sending extra photos to us. Uh, so it's good to be with, it was good to be with you guys this morning. Colossians chapter 2. So um, from verse 6. If you are looking for a title, it was in the invitation today and it's called Conqueror. That's what it is. So 2 verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And we're going to focus a little bit, in a sense, almost on walking in Him, right? Because Friday has come, Friday has come and gone, and Sunday has arrived. Hello? Hello? Something happened on Sunday that changed everything. And in fact, without Sunday, Friday would be pointless. Friday would not be Good Friday without Sunday. Okay? I'll never forget this. You see, I told you I'm going to be long. Um, I was listening to 702, and, and listen, I say this with, with a bit of trepidation and fear, but Eusebius MacKaiser, you guys, some of you know he's an incredibly intelligent guy, very well known, South African media, etc., etc., Never forget him listening to a show he was doing, and he had some guests on the show, and they were talking about Easter. What is Easter? And, uh, and they were talking about the Easter bunny and the this and the that. And he said, yeah, but Christians, what do Christians say about Easter? And, and, uh, and someone said they call it Good Friday, and, and, he, and he laughed because they told him that Jesus died on Good Friday. He said, and he laughed. He laughed. On, I'm not exaggerating. I was listening to the show. He laughed. He said, why on earth would they call it Good Friday if he died? Right? As you know, Eusebius Makaiser is no longer with us. I hope, I do hope and pray that in some point, in some way, he encountered the reason it's called Good Friday. Amen. Right? <clears throat> it's Good Friday, but it's not Good Friday without Sunday. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty, empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. What was happening in Colossae is that there were all of these ideas, as is happening all the time, attacking the purity of the gospel, the purity about the truth about who Christ was, who Christ is, what he has done for us. That was under attack. That is always under attack. It's nothing new under the sun, all right? Verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. We're going to come back to that in a moment. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I'm not sure if Christ, uh, Chris touched on this um, on Friday, but we have been circumcised in his death. Right, The flesh has been cut off. We've been circumcised. They would have been circumcised. Uh, as a sign of the covenant that they had with God, this is a new sign that we have died with Christ, and so we've been circumcised, and we're in covenantal relationship with the living God in a way that cannot be changed. Amen. Verse 12, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God. Now, that's the important part, right? That we were raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead? God did. Okay? Who's going to raise you from the dead? Or who has raised you from the dead if you're in Christ? God did. And who is going to raise you on that day? God is going to do it. Verse 13, And you who were dead in your trespasses 
and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him. Who made you alive? alive. Amen. Did you make yourself alive? No. no. It's a work of His grace and His mercy. That's good news. That never changes, by the way. Right? I, I cannot be honest. I'll make a confession here that I slip into legalism all the time. All the time. I'm reading a book now. I won't get into it, but like, it's, it's a book by um, Sinclair Ferguson, who is a Scottish theologian and preacher. But I, I sent Chris a couple of screenshots. I thought maybe he could help me understand what I just read. Um, I, I, like it's, just, it's one of those books. But the reason I love listening or, or reading Sinclair Ferguson is because he's got such... One of his things is unity with Christ, union with Christ. He's big on union with Christ. And he was, he's teaching on that, but also teaching on how the law is misunderstood and how the law, and we're going to get to it in a moment, actually is a representation of God and the goodness of God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then he talked about how as pastors, sometimes we can allow... Um, legalism to slip into our hearts and I was like yeah that's me I realize that often even in my preaching it's got legalism threaded through it right which I need to repent of and forgive me and I really genuinely mean that forgive me it's not always so easy to recognize it's very subtle but hopefully today will encourage us nonetheless right he has made us God made alive together with him having forgiven us all of our trespasses is that good news? Man, that's good news. Right? I wouldn't forgive me, but he has. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm like, I've done some stupid things and it's unforgivable. It's how you feel about it sometimes. Like it's, I'm just, it's unforgivable. That he has forgiven you. Amen. I'm forgiven. And so are you if you're in Christ. You are forgiven. Right? Forgiven us all of our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt. That's what I want to focus on today, Manny. By cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He cancelled the record of debt with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Okay? So verse 14, he removes the record of Death, uh, not death, debt. The problem is this, is that there's a record of debt against all of us. Every one of us, there's a record of debt against us. What is that record of debt? Well, it's revealed by the law, the law of God, the moral law of God is God's desire for mankind. This is how you are meant to live. And so when we do not live that way, we miss the mark. That's what sin is, hamartia, we miss the mark. We don't live in a way that we're meant to live. We miss the mark. And that is called sin, right? And then sin is clocking up some debt. And you know what that debt, the wages of that debt is? The Bible says the wages of sin is? Death. death. That seems a little unreasonable, don't you think? Not at all. Not if we realize the weight of our sin. And let me give you an analogy because here's what the, the law does. The law puts the full weight of God's expectation of us. But that is actually a good thing. We're going to get to that in a moment. But the full weight of God's expectation, not of our own expectation or expectation of people around us, right? Which is often, not often, the always much lower than God's expectation of us. Okay? But here's what happens is the weight of not getting there begins to take its toll. It just begins to take its toll. I'll give you this analogy. I've never swum the Midmar, Midmar Mile. Who's swum the Midmar Mile yet? Overachievers. What's wrong with you? Yes. <laughs> the Midmar, Ma, Ma, Midmar, Ma, Ma, the Midmar Mile <laughs> right, is 1.6 kilometers. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I don't think I've swum 16 meters in my life, so I don't know how I would do it. So if I decide this afternoon I'm going to drive to Midmar and I'm going to go and swim the mid mile mile myself. No help, no nothing. No flotation device, no wings, whatever, nothing. I'm going to go swim that thing, all right? And I swim and make it 1.580 meters. 1,580 1, meters, sorry. I mean, say kilometers. <laughs> 1,580 meters. Let's assume I, I make it that far. But I, I, I just run out of steam. 
my, my arms, my legs feel like lead. I get a cramp. I cannot swim any long. I can't. I've got nothing left, right? <clears throat> because I train so hard, obviously. Okay, I've got nothing left. And I drown. Okay? And I die. Am I dead? All right? Now, let's say Chris swims it, right? And I reckon you'll make it to about 80 meters. All right? <laughs> Let's say Chris makes it 80 meters, okay? And he also, he's alone and he gets a cramp when he, he's, and he sinks to the bottom and he swallows water and, and he's dead. Is he dead? Okay. Now, let's say um, Andrea, because my wife's an overachiever, right? Let's say she swims it and she goes 1,595 meters, right? But she runs out of steam, Okay. She runs out of steam, swallows water, drowns, and dies. Which one of us are more dead than the other? <laughs> Let me put it this way. Uh, am I more alive than Christ? Because I'm uh, Chris, rather, because I made it further than him. No. Is Andrew more alive than me? No. If you don't make it, you don't make it. Yeah. You're dead. Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? Amen. Now, here's the problem with sin. Okay, irrespective of how you think you live your life morally, and how clean your life is, you might think you've managed to swim almost all the way there. I'm just within grasp of the holiness of God. I, I could almost earn this thing. Let's assume for a moment that's true, okay? Just for one moment. I think, Eleanor, I think for Eleanor that might be very true. <laughs> Rest of us know. <laughs> Shall I phone Kevin? Just find out. Hey, Kevin. She's gonna... <clears throat> all right. It doesn't matter how well you live your life. The bottom line, the Bible is very clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're dead, you're dead. Does it make sense? And so people are trying to live morally superior lives, trying to earn their way into the glory and the wonder of God and the mercy of God, and you can't do it because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all of us, therefore, have a debt against our name and the wages of that debt for everyone, 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 no exception, is death, yeah. eternal death. Yeah. Now I say, my why? Why is that the case? Because God is a holy God. Now, when we say God is a holy God, it's hard for us to fathom and understand this because we don't understand the holiness of God. We see holiness as like, you know, good moral behavior. Yeah. But God is holy means he is perfect in all his ways by his standards, not yours. Yeah. He is perfect in all of his ways, in his character, his nature, his behavior, in his judgments, in his thoughts, in his desires, in his entire existence and his being. He is perfection. The Bible says he is light and in him is no darkness, zero darkness. So can you see what it takes to get into his presence? Zero darkness. And that is not true for any one of us. And that is why the wages of sin is dead. But the law is good. I do want to just say this. It embodies the very character and the nature of God. The law is good because God is good. And because God is good, the law is actually good. And if we lived according to the law perfectly, it would cause human flourishing. You see, we have viewed the law wrongly. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. Okay? There are many people who preach that the law no longer matters. That's not true. It's called antinomianism is a big word. Every now and again, I like throwing in a big word just so I appear to be more intelligent than I really am. Okay? <clears throat> Kevin, what is antinomian? antinomian? Oh, it's an ISE. I can't even say it now. <clears throat> but if we disregard the word, that, the, the law, that's what we do. God never disregards the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. And now he's written his law on our hearts. God still has an expectation of us to live according to his moral law. But for different reasons. We want to glorify his name. We want to live in a way that reflects who he is, his very character and his very nature. And we've been empowered by his spirit, by the resurrection power that comes with the Holy Spirit to do so. Does it make sense? Now we desire to please him and honor him and live in a way that glorifies him. That's what has shifted. That's what has changed. His grace now empowers us. And not only that, it actually, His grace changes our desires. We actually now even desire to live according to His law. 
And if we have no desire to live according to His law, we have to wrestle with the heart and say, do I have the grace of God in me? The grace of God doesn't move us away from the law of God. The grace of God moves us towards the law of God. Does it make sense? But the beautiful thing is, is that Christ, whatever the gap is, 5 meters, 10 meters, 1,200 meters, it is really immaterial. The gap has been filled with Christ. And in fact, what you realize is that you were never swimming to begin with. You were on a boat the whole way and he was taking you across. You know, there's this whole notion that, that, that exists out there that people believe, Christians believe, no, God meets me halfway. No. You, you can't get halfway. He meets you on the shore and says, okay, we, we're doing this together. He meets you wherever you're at, right? Wherever you start, that's where he meets you. He's the one that comes to you. He's the one that saves you. He's the one that's taking you across. It's on him. It's not on us. Amen? Amen? <clears throat> living according to the law causes human flourishing, right? And so Jesus didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled the law. He did what we could not do to make us what we could not be. All right? The debt is determined by how far we fall short. And listen, I've just explained it, that we fall short. And the consequences are dire. It's eternal death. But Jesus Christ is made away, right? <clears throat> Uh, turn with me to Ephesians 6, verses 12. Uh, I want to read, my, hold on, let me, before we go there, let's just read verse 15. Can you put verse 15 up there again quickly for me? He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So first of all, he got rid of this debt, right? This demand of this legal demand, this debt that was due because of the fact that you fall short. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. But not only that, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Now turn with me to Ephesians 6, verses 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. Now, what is in opposition to you living according to the law of God? What is in opposition to live in the glory of God, in the purpose of God, for the joy of God? What is in opposition to you doing that? Well, it's your own flesh, but it's not only your own flesh, but principalities and powers and spirits of darkness. That does exist. And the problem is, is we forget that. Right? What do you think is exerting pressure on you that is causing you to turn away from the Lord or causing you to give in to sin and temptation? It's not just your flesh. It is your flesh, but it's also principalities and powers. There is a spiritual realm. And it's a spiritual realm that Jesus took care of when he walked out of the grave. Hallelujah. Rendering them toothless. Stripping them of their facade of perceived authority. <coughs> the Bible says that the devil goes around like a roaring lion. Now he has a measure of authority, but it's usurped authority. It is not legitimate authority. He does have power, but it's not the ultimate power. And what did Jesus do when he walked out the grave? He demonstrated that ultimately he is the one, the only one who truly is powerful, all powerful. He is the only one that truly has the ultimate authority. Jesus and Jesus alone. And the language that is used there is that it's a mocking language. That Jesus was putting to shame the principalities and powers. And it is quite astonishing that while Jesus was shamefully hanging on a cross, he was putting them to shame. He exposed them while he was exposed on the cross. He exposed the powerlessness of the principalities and powers and the evil one whilst he was powerless hanging on a cross. This is something I've been thinking about a lot because if you're anything like me, you struggle sometimes. You struggle? Okay. We struggle, right? And sometimes I'm going, man, I'm supposed to be better than this. 
We talk about resurrection power on Resurrection Sunday. I'm going, can someone show me where this power is, maybe? <laughs> I'm running short. That's why we prayed for people, right? What I realize is I misinterpret this often. It's a subtle misinterpretation or misunderstanding or mis- misapplication is probably the better word I'm looking for there, is that we think the resurrection power that comes from God somehow makes me something apart from God. Does it make sense? And so we use the power of God as a means to an end. And say, Jesus, this is what I need in order for me to live a holy life. Can you just give me what I need? Thank you. The moment you walk away from him, you've missed the point entirely. He is the one that put to shame the powers and the authority. He is the one that proved that he is ultimately the ultimate authority and the only real power. He is the one that walked out the grave. And so what we should be doing is running to Jesus and clinging to Jesus. Does it make sense? If you want to walk in victory, you need Jesus. And so, man, I I was encouraged this week because I realized, Kevin, you get to be weak, not sinful. That's not what I'm saying. But you just get to be who you are, bro. And Jesus gets to be who he is. And that combination can do some, some things. That combination is what changes the world. And this is so profound that Jesus overcame sin and darkness. He overcame principalities, powers. He overcame kingdoms and kings and empires. He overcame it by dying on a cross. Isn't that astonishing? At his weakest moment, at his most vulnerable moment, at his most exposed moment is when the most powerful thing in all of creation was happening. And it's no different for us. And so the title today is Conqueror. I don't want people walking out here like strutting their stuff. No, we should be walking out here in humility, knowing that there's someone with me. There's nothing special about me. I know me. I know my limitations. I know my sin. I know my brokenness. I know my propensities. I know. But I also know my Savior. I also know my King. I also know my Lord. I also know my Redeemer. And you know what He did? You know what He did? He walked out the grave. He conquered sin and death. He put openly publicly to shame the principalities and the powers who want to drag me down and sell me a lie and sell me down the river of sin and debauchery or weakness and disobedience or rebellion or faithlessness or hopelessness or depression or discouragement or whatever that is. They want to sell me down that river and the Savior goes, I don't think so. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. This is the thing about Christ. This is why the Jews missed him, right? And are still missing him. This is why we miss him every day. How do you expect expect the conqueror to arrive in your life sometimes? By putting you, you know, making you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And come, you should know them. What are the what are the other things they say? No, sometimes we're just struggling. Sometimes when life sucks. Sometimes when you're going through a valley of despair. Sometimes when you're overwhelmed by your own struggles. The spirit of truth just whispers. He's still the conqueror. Your name is written in the book of life. You died with him. But you were also resurrected. Same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. He's with you. He's in you. My grace is sufficient for you. Keep going. It's not about you. Listen, I think God is going to do big things through Crowded House Church. Is that ambition talking? Maybe a bit. I can't tell. I don't think so. I think that's the Spirit speaking. 
Why would God not want to do big things through us? Because he's not doing it for our glory. He's doing it for his own glory. Listen, I don't think that we have got enough of an unrealistic expectation of what the Lord wants to do. I think we are way too safe. And last week, two weeks ago when Jonathan was here, actually we received a bit of a rebuke from him. I mean, he publicly basically rebuked the elders. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> Not inviting that oak back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because from an apostolic position, he could see some things. We could see it, but he just helped us to see it. He said, okay, I know you see it, but look, Mampara, okay? Make some changes. And so I'm very happy to announce that we have given notice on this thing. <laughs> And we will be moving in two months' time, right next door. It's a beginning. Not sure how this thing's going to work out. I want to just honor Charlie for his faith. Let me tell you, you cut Charlie, he bleeds, Clara, us, church, and Sonia. They love us so much, and we are so grateful for them. He scares me. But I think God's going to do some beautiful things. Amen? Amen. This is the beauty about the promise of God. The fact that Jesus was going to die, and he himself said, and prophecies, countless prophecies said, he would be in the grave for three nights and three days, but on the third day, he would rise again. Speaks of the fact that we're part of an eternal, transcendent plan by an eternal God. Everything that he has promised has come to pass. Everything that he has promised will still come to pass. We are part of something that will happen. Hello? Hallelujah. And I say we, not me and the elders, we. That's you as well. Say me. me. You're part of it. You're part of what the Lord is doing in the earth and what he wants to do in the earth. You're part of the people that he wants to reach in and through this local church. You're part of it. You're part of it. God is setting us up for his glory. And even if you're dying a shameful death on the cross, if it's in obedience to the Lord, God is at work. Amen. The conqueror is conquering. You see, we believe the lie that says, if you truly are a follower of Jesus and you have the Spirit of God, the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwelling in you, well then you need to act like a conqueror and you're going to walk around as if you are Jesus. Now there is truth in that. I'm not saying we're going to shrink back, but here's the good news. Jesus will have His glory. Amen. This is the point. Do you know that every one of Jesus' special 12 ran away? It, were the, it was the woman who had faith first when they went to the grave. It was the woman. They had an anticipation. Where were the apostles? They were, I don't know. They were watching Netflix. I don't know. They were, uh, what they were doing. And do you know that when the woman went, and the language that is used there to tell them that they did not believe for two reasons, and this is sad. It just shows you the how even their own hearts had not been transformed to, at that point beyond this, is that culturally women would never be listened to at that time. They would not listen to a woman's testimony. This is how we know the gospels to be true, because anyone peddling a lie is not going to use that, because no one's going to believe it. That's honestly the case at the time. They did not listen to a woman's testimony. And so there was probably some of that even in the guys still, although these women hung around them and Jesus for a long time. When the woman ran and said, the tomb is empty, they're like, whatever. We don't believe it. That's honestly what their response was initially. It took a little while for Peter to warm up and go, we've got to go see. Now you're thinking, bro, Jesus has been telling these guys on the eve of his crucifixion, he has dinner with them. I mean, they've seen miracles, things we have never seen in our lives. They've walked with God incarnate. I mean, what more do you want? Right? And we are guilty of this. Lord, just show me something more. Just do something else. Just, 
convince me one more time. I don't know what you expect Jesus to, you, to do to make you to believe that he is who he says he is, that nothing is impossible for him. Because if they walked with God in the flesh and still doubted, then what more is there? Hello? But yet God used them because they were part of his glorious plan. It wasn't their plan. It was his. Crowded us church, it wasn't my plan. It was his. Amen. You being here was not your plan. You're going, hey, you better believe it because I would never come to a church like this, bro. <laughs> I'm going, well, tough cookie because he placed you here. So deal with it. Honestly, we're part of a plan that he set in motion. Jesus walking out the grave I was like, yeah, and what did you expect? I've been promising this for hundreds of years. How could you not see this? This is the disbelief that God had. Right? Jesus goes to Thomas. Thomas is like, no, show me your hands. Let me press there. Let me see. I'm not having a go, Thomas. I'm probably Thomas. But here's the glorious news. These were not super men. These were not super anointed men. They became that when they realized how doff they were, when they realized how much they need Jesus, when they realized how merciful and gracious and kind he is, when they realized that he would choose them to be part of their master plan, and yet they had zero credibility. Then they realized, oh, it's not up to us. Okay, I'm with Jesus because he's doing the doing. He's the one that walked out the grave. Not Peter, not Paul, not John. Jesus walked out the grave. He is the one that said, wait in Jerusalem for the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that baptizes us and then empowers us to do what we otherwise could not do. Not only that, we would not want to do it. Man, I'm learning to trust in the Spirit more because if it's up to Kev, guys, I would say to you now, Find another church. Honestly, that is the truth. But if I submit my life to Jesus along with the elders and our wives and we lead you according to His will, empowered by His Spirit, then I'm saying this, put on your seatbelts. Arm yourselves. It's going to get toasty. <laughs> Amen? While we were still dead in our sins, the Bible says, Christ died for us. What did you do to earn what he has given you? Nothing. So what do you do to keep earning his empowering? Nothing. We just receive it by faith. And we walk in it by his grace, empowered by his spirit. Man, I'm preaching myself happy this morning. <laughs> The crucifixion, crucifixion and the death of Jesus and his resurrection was because a sovereign God was establishing what had already been put in motion before the foundations of the earth. And he was establishing it to the man Jesus. Do you know that Jesus overcame principalities and powers, kingdoms and empires, sin and death as a man? Hello? Why did he do that? What was he demonstrating? If you rely on God, nothing is impossible. The other scary part is this. If you rely on God, you're probably going to walk in the realm of the impossible. But that's where life is is. Nowhere else. If we are meandering around and prancing around in the arena of us, I don't care how much people love that. We're wasting our time. I often feel like even following Jesus, not even as a leader, is beyond me. Does anyone else feel like that? I'm like, bro, I'm still battling with this sin. I still have this character issue. I'm like, 
You know, if ever I were to deconvert, or what do they call it? Deconstruct or whatever they call it. You've seen this, right? <clears throat> From Christianity. It wouldn't be because of what I see in the world and how can God allow this and how can God allow that. It would be like I'm looking in the mirror and going, there's just too much stuff here, man. Because that's how I feel sometimes. Like, you look at Jesus and you look at yourself and you go, I still see it. A very large chasm. But what does the Spirit do? He keeps pulling you. He keeps drawing you. Come to me. Come to me. All who are heavy laden, come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Listen, you are united with Christ. He's there to stay. And if you're united with Christ, then we've got to keep walking with Him. And if we keep walking with Him, you're going to feel out of sorts most of the time. That's a good thing. Don't lean into self. Lean into him. Man, I, this morning, it was last night, this morning, I don't know, I didn't sleep a lot. I felt like the Spirit said to me, Kevin, what are you so afraid of? Why are you so afraid? And you know what he said? Because I care too much about my reputation. I care way too much about what people might think about me if they knew me. That's the truth. If you really knew who I was. I care too much about the pain that might come, the cost that might be involved. And he said, what are you? I've walked out the grave. I've secured an eternal hope for you. I am sovereignly ruling over everything. What are you so afraid of? What are you so afraid of? It was G.K. Chesterton who said this. He said, a scared world needs a brave church. We cannot be brave because we're shooting the lights out. The only reason I can be brave is because Jesus said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. The one who walked out the grave, who conquered sin and death, principalities and powers, kingdoms and empires. That Jesus is with us and he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. Colossians 2 verses 9 to 10. I'm skipping a whole bunch of scriptures because we truly will be here too long. I'm just going to read it there. For in him, in him, in who? In Jesus. The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Okay, speaking about Jesus as a man, the fullness of God's deity dwells within him bodily. And you have been filled in him. Notice it doesn't say, and you have been filled with him. It's interesting, right? It doesn't say you've been filled with him. You know why? Because if we were filled with him, we'd say, thank you very much, and we'll be on our way. No, how do you remain full in him? You remain in him. We remain in him. You say, I don't deserve to be in him. I'm like, bro, take a number and get in line. I'm in the front here. I also don't deserve to be in him. And you have been filled in him. Who is the head of all rule and authority? And if he has conquered sin and death, guess what? So have you. If he has conquered principalities and powers, get, guess what? Hello? So have you. If he has conquered kingdoms and kings and empires, so have you. But how do we conquer? Not by fighting. How do we conquer? By yielding. We conquer by yielding. We conquer by acknowledging how weak we are. We conquer by crying out to the only one who walked out the grave, Jesus, our Redeemer. We conquer by clinging to him with everything that we have. All we are, we cling to him. That's how we conquer, because he has already conquered. He is the conqueror, and that's who we cling to. And we do that by the power of the Spirit. Our union with Christ changes everything. We died with him but we have been resurrected with Him. 
We died with Him, but we have been resurrected with Him. Thank you, brother. We died with Him, but we have been resurrected with Him. Now, we do live in the already and the not yet. And what that simply means, I don't have time to get into it, is that it is 100% true. We have already conquered. We have already been resurrected. We have already been forgiven. Uh, we already are in heaven, so to speak. We are re- it's a done deal, but not yet. We still have a fight to fight. We are still in this world. The fullness of everything that God has claimed for us, we're not walking in it yet, but it is ours. Amen? Amen. And so we have to learn to walk in us. In our weakness and our frailty and struggles, we are still more than conquerors if we cling to the conqueror. And I want to say this, that you are trophies of God's grace. That is what you are. As we cling to Him, God wants to do the unthinkable through you. I've said this many times before. I don't know if people believe me. I never saw myself as a church planter. That's the honest truth. And when I say that, I didn't think I could plant a church. I never thought I could plant. I could never plant a church. I didn't even think about it. Well, look what the Lord has done. How many church planters are sitting here? No, don't just look forward. Look around. Ask some people around you. Are you being obedient to the Lord? <laughs> Hello. If I could do it, what makes me special? You don't know. What, why do you think God would choose me? Apart from the glorious beard. <laughs> oh, I do have some beard envy as I scan the room, though. <laughs> Nothing is impossible for him for those who believe. You're a trophy of his grace. Anything good about you, anything glorious, anything conquering about your life is meant to be a trophy of His grace. It's meant to be a trophy that displays His grace, His goodness, His glory, His wonder, His splendor, His mercy. And so I'm going, man, let's be trophies of His grace. Let's do the impossible. Let's do the things that we don't want to do. Let's walk as resurrected people. Let's walk as sons and daughters of the Most High God because that is who we are. And so keep fighting that sin. Keep fighting those character flaws. Keep fighting your rebellion. Keep fighting your disobedience. Keep fighting your laziness. Keep fighting your lack of faith. Keep fighting your depression. Keep fighting your despair. Keep fighting your disobedience, your discouragement. Keep fighting the good fight of faith because it's true. He walked out the grave. He claimed you for himself, and he has something that he wants to do in you and through you. Amen? Amen. I want to read two more scriptures. Revelation 17, 14. Do we have it there? Or shall I get it here? I've got it here. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer. Notice, Jesus overcame the devil, not as a king, but as a a lamb. Think about that. Listen, the church is not powerful because we're kings. The church church is powerful because we have a king. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. (laughs) I love it. They'll make war on the lamb, the little lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. Right? <clears throat> For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Amen. Are we on team Jesus? Yes. Hello? Are we on team Jesus? Yes. Are we with him? Yes. Are you with him? Yes. One more text. Revelation 19. 11 to 16, yeah, that's good. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. Is that right? And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. 
He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Now for guys, that's like, yeah, but for the ladies as well. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen. Listen, the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the conqueror. And whatever happens to our lives between now and your death or now and his return, that remains true. That remains true. We are going to plant churches. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to raise up more elders, raise up more deacons, raise up more faithful saints. We are going to charge the gates of hell and it will not prevail against us. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. More than conquerors through Christ. Let's stand. Jesus, <coughs> people will dispute it, people will disregard it, people will ignore it, but the fact that you walked out the grave proved that you are the one true living God. The Bible says that you hold all things together. And ultimately, you will be the judge of every one of us standing in this room, but you'll also be the judge of every person that has ever walked the face of the planet. Whatever color, creed, tongue, nation, whatever, Father, era, whatever, time, whatever, Lord, they will give an account to the one true living God, and that is you, Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that you took on flesh. Jesus, you took on flesh and walked on this earth by faith, empowered by the Spirit. How much more are we to walk by faith, empowered by the Spirit? I thank you, Lord, that your word declares that you are now seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. And do you know this, that Jesus is still in the flesh. He's got a resurrected body. He took on flesh which he has not shed. He has a resurrected body. He continues to identify with us. Think about that. As the high priest, he continues to identify with us. And he is praying for his own. He is praying for us. And I want to say this. He believes in you. Have you ever heard that? Jesus saying, I believe in you. And you say, how can you say that? Well, I believe in who dwells in you, and it's me. You know what I see when I look at you? I see me. I see my spirit. I see my very nature. You're mine, and I am yours. You're in me, and I'm in you, and I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. You've been united to me for all eternity. You belong to me. You're my precious bride. That's who you are. And I've chosen you through which I will reveal my glory. And I've chosen you to walk in the spirit of the conqueror. Because I have overcome. Father, empower us by your spirit. I just want to say this. There's always a physical thing that we can do that displays what is in our heart. If you want to make a determination today in your heart, again, if you're going to say, I'm on team Jesus. I'll do whatever he wants me to do. I will do whatever it takes. But I'm going to walk in this resurrection power. I'm going to keep fighting the good fight. I'm going to be obedient to him. I'm going to be a part of what the Lord wants to do in the earth. If that's you, I want you to raise your hands to him. Raise your hands to him. Jesus, here we are. Just flesh and blood but not just flesh and blood because we carry your very presence. We have been marked by your blood. 
sealed with your spirit. Names written in the book of life. We have been counted with the faithful that have gone before us. We are part of the army of God. We are part of the household of the Lord. We are your bride. We are your church. We belong to you. Jesus, I pray that you would use us for your glory. Keep taking us beyond ourselves. Keep taking us beyond ourselves. I pray that we would walk by faith, empowered by your Spirit, in obedience to you, so that you can put on display your glory, your splendor, and your wonder. We exist to make you known. Right now, I pray, Spirit, would you fill us? Fill us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.